Hello everyone, and it is indeed a blessing, a privilege, and an opportunity to come before you once again to hear what the Word of God is saying to us. Although many may think, yes, the Bible, but it never goes out of season at all because it's an all-season book that all of us in our lives that we experience the goodness of God and it only comes through His Word. So I pray that as we open up today our hearts and hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us today. Be blessed in the teaching of the, the book of Acts part 2. And I pray that part 1 was truly a blessing to you and your family. So the book of Acts part 2. Let's briefly look at the overview of the book of Acts. The book of Acts or the Acts of the Apostles is the fifth book of the New Testament. It tells of the founding of the Christian church and the spread of its message to the Roman Empire. Both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts were addressed to a man named Theophilus and have been accepted as written by the same author. While the author is not named in either volume, according to church tradition, the author was the Luke named as companion of the Apostle Paul in three of the letters attributed to Paul himself. The title Acts of the Apostles was first used by Irenaeus in the late second century. As we've seen in part one, the Gospel of Luke tells how God fulfilled his plan for the world's salvation through the life, death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, the promised Messiah. The book of Acts continues the story of Christianity in the first century, beginning with the ascension of Jesus to heaven. The early chapters set in Jerusalem describe the day of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the growth of the church in Jerusalem. The later chapters tell of Paul's conversion, his mission in Asia Minor and the Aegean, and finally his imprisonment in Rome, where as the book ends he awaits trial. The earliest possible date for Luke Acts is around 62 AD, the time of Paul's imprisonment in Rome. Many scholars date the work to between 80 and 90 AD, although the book does not mention the deaths of Peter or Paul, nor the destruction of the temple, ending where Paul is still awaiting trial in Rome. The book of Acts selectively covers the first 30 years of the church's history. Luke traces the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome. Luke continues to be shown to be accurate in his depiction of countries, cities, people and officials. The book of Acts forms an important bridge between the gospels and the Pauline epistles. The structure of the book of Acts, as we saw last time, the book of Acts can be broken down into two parts. Chapters 1 through 12 is the foundation of the church and 13 through 26 looking at the founders of the church. And 13 through 26 focus predominantly on the apostle Paul and the mission to the Gentiles and covers approximately 14 years from round about AD 48 to 62 and we looked at the structure and the relationship of the first 12 books in part one and as we saw there are nine features of the book of Acts one the true nature of the mission of the church and the source of its power secondly the role of the Holy Spirit three the early church messages by Peter Stephen Paul and James fourth the importance of regular and fervent prayer Fifthly, the signs, wonders and miracles that were accompanied the work of the church. Sixth, persecution, proclaiming the gospel with power, brings opposition. Seventh, the Jew-Gentile sequence, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Eighth, the important role of women in the early church. And nine, the triumph of the gospel, that no barriers could thwart the advance of the gospel. So as we begin with chapter 15, we see that a dispute arises from a group that came to Antioch from Judea, who insisted that it is not possible to be saved if you're not circumcised. Saul and Barnabas dispute this and are appointed to go to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders on this question. In Jerusalem, some of the believers who were also Pharisees also put forward the view that there was no salvation without circumcision. And as we read in verse 6 of chapter 15, the apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them. Just as he did to us, he did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles, a yoke that neither we no our ancestors have been able to bear. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. 
Simon has described to us how God has intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things. Things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times, and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Basabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. With them they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, who are the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia, greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you troubling your mind by what they said so we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ therefore we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the believers with a blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. Paul and Barnabas decided to return to the churches they had founded to see how they were doing, but they disagree about whether John Mark should accompany them, and as a result they part ways. Barnabas going to Cyprus with Mark, and Paul going through Syria and Cilicia with Silas. In chapter 16, Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, but they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they travelled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Paul and his companions travelled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. We being an indication that Luke was with them at this point. They travelled to Philippi where Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth, responds to Paul's message and is baptised, and then invites Paul and his companions to stay at her house. While in Philippi, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned round and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realised that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison 
and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prison was shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. The next day the officials ordered Paul and Silas to be released. But Paul insists they do it personally as he is a Roman citizen. They stop at Lydia's house to encourage the believers, then leave Philippi. The next major stop is Thessalonica. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob and started a riot in the city. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to the sea that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happened to be there. People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives every one life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offsprings, therefore since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, the council who oversaw areas of religion and morals. Also a woman named Damaris and a number of others. In chapter 18, Paul goes to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, 
who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Tertius Justus, a worshipper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader and his entire household, believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night the Lord said to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in the city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and travelled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and he spoke with great fervour and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Acacia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. In chapter 19, Paul goes to Ephesus. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. They were about twelve men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannius. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even the handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in a high honour. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number of practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Acacia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer.
Tradesmen who made a living from the worship of idols are concerned about the loss of income and reputation for their gods and goddesses, and a riot ensues, but is calmed down by the city clerk. When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. He travelled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months. Because some Jews had plotted against him, just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. We sailed from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread, and five days later joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. On the first day of the week we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Etoikos, who was sinking into deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you? From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseas. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. For I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourself know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. Paul and his party sailed to Tyre, where they stayed with the disciples for seven days. They urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem, but Paul continues his voyage, first to Ptolemus and then Caesarea, where they stayed with Philip the Evangelist. Again, Paul receives prophecy that he would be bound and turned over to the Gentiles in Jerusalem. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem, 
Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, The Lord's will be done. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses telling them not to circumcise the ch children or live according to our customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. The next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us! This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he's brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian in the city with Paul, and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another, and since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. Paul is given permission to speak to the crowd, and he gives his testimony, which quiets the crowd until he says, When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him, he's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do, he asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. <laughs> then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. But I was born a citizen. Paul replied, those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. The commander releases Paul but brings him before the Sanhedrin. Paul splits the Sanhedrin as he claims he's on trial for hoping in the resurrection, an issue the Sadducees and Pharisees disagree about. There was a great uproar and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. 
We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Some Jews plot to kill Paul, but his nephew discovers it and warns Paul, who in turn tells the guards. The commander then sends Paul with guards to Governor Felix in Caesarea to hear Paul's accusers present their case against him. Felix hears the charges against Paul and Paul's defence, but makes no decision, saying he will wait for the Roman commander from Jerusalem before he makes a decision. Several days later, Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, That's enough for now, you may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant a favour to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. When Festus takes office, the priests present the charges against Paul and request he be tried in Jerusalem. Festus returns to Caesarea and convenes the court. When Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. They brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove them. Then Paul made his defence. I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law, or against the temple, or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favour, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court, where I ought to be tried. I have not done anything wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar? To Caesar you will go. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He replied, Tomorrow you will hear him. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officers and the prominent men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with you, see this man. The whole Jewish communities petition me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found he had done nothing deserving of death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore I brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation I may have something to write. For I think it unreasonable to send a prisoner on to Rome without specifying the charges against him. In chapter 26, Paul speaks before King Agrippa, giving his testimony, his life, and his conversion. So then, King Agrippa, I was not dis disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preach that they should repent and turn to God, and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple course and tried to kill me. But God has kept me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. That the Messiah would suffer and, as the first to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defence. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane. Most excellent, Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe in the prophets? I know you do. 
Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, Short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice and those sitting with them. After they left the room, they began saying to one another, This man's not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Paul is then sent to Rome as a prisoner, sailing in several craft with delays on the way. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous, because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous. I bring great loss to ship and cargo, and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul had said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbour was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbour in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Man, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, man, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. The sailors sense their approaching land, but Paul warns them not to desert the ship or they would perish. They throw the cargo overboard. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get their own planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. They discovered they were on Malta. Paul is bitten by a viper, but without any ill effect, and so the local people went from believing he was a sinner who could not escape death to believing he was a god. Paul then here was the father of the chief official of the island. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honoured us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods Castor and Pollux. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day the south wind came up and on the following day we reached Putoli. There we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters there had heard that we were coming and they travelled as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these people Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Paul reaches out to the local Jewish community to tell them he had not done any wrong against them, but they had not heard of the events in Jerusalem. And in chapter 28, verse 22, But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking about this sect. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He tried to persuade them about Jesus. 
Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said to Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Acts Part 2 Conclusion The second part of the book of Acts focuses on the ministry of Paul, a man turned from persecutor of the church to a planter of churches. One encounter of Jesus and he was a changed man. He suffered hardships as we read in 2 Corinthians 11. Paul says, I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have laboured and toiled, and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst, and often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Beside everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin, and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. But Paul planted churches, and he spent his life sharing the good news, ultimately giving his life for the gospel. The Holy Spirit changes our perspective on what should be our goals in life. No longer the selfish goals that satisfy me, myself and I, but living to fulfill the purpose God has for our lives. If you wish to be part of this great plan of God's, then will you pray this prayer with us. Dear God in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I acknowledge to you that I am a sinner and I am sorry for my sins and the life that I have lived. I need your forgiveness. I believe your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, shed his precious blood on the cross at Calvary and died for my sins, and I am now willing to turn from my sin. You said in the Bible that if we confess that the Lord our God and believe in our hearts God raised Jesus from the dead, we shall be saved. Right now I confess Jesus as my Lord. With my heart I believe God raised Jesus from the dead. This very moment I accept Jesus Christ as my own personal Saviour, and according to his word, Right now I am saved. Amen. Amen. And so having prayed that prayer, you're now part of the kingdom of God. But this is just the beginning. You need to strengthen yourself and strengthen your knowledge of God and about God. And how do we do that? By reading the Bible, by spending time in prayer with God, and also joining a church that teaches the fundamental beliefs of Christ and the Bible, and so fellowship with other believers because we need that, that fellowship to help us get through the challenges of life when we as newborn Christians face all sorts of temptation from the devil to try and make us forget about our newborn commitment and we try and tempt us back into that past lifestyle. But we pray that you'll continue to be strong in the Lord. Always pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to empower you just as those early disciples did. Paul went through much, but he was true to the gospel. And that's what God is asking us to do. Life is a journey of faith. If we knew everything that, were, that was going to happen to us, then we'd never have to have faith because we would know. But life is not like that. We need to have faith that despite what happens, despite the uncertainties, that God will always come through for us. Many times in ways that we don't expect or understand. But he is true and he's faithful. Thank God and for his Holy Spirit and for our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Yes, again, it's a privilege, it's a great blessing to be reminded of the importance of the third person in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit.
Uh, here we have learned the teachings of the book of Acts, but also being mindful of how Saul was converted and his name has been changed to Paul. But also, even in that process, before Saul was converted, for those who have followed Christ, who were Christians, they were being chastised and going through hardships and difficult times. Saul did not fully understand the price that had to be paid. And of course, we as believers know what God's word already told us what will happen. But way back then, he didn't have a full understanding of what a believe in Christ's life was all about. It was just representing Jesus Christ um, and advancing the kingdom of God. And we know here that God has used this very Saul to be a testimony to advance his kingdom. Paul had to feel and experience what believers in Christ had at that time and season in their life. And even today, all of us, especially those that are called, they're chosen, anointed, and appointed. Yes, there will be hardships. There will be circumstances challenging. There will be lots of discouragement. But God's word says, fear not, I'm with you. In spite of what you're going through. The assignment that I have given you, I will give you the endurance. I'll give you the perseverance and the strength to complete it. But what God starts in, in you and I, we are well able to complete it and accomplish it for his glory. And God will make a way where there seems to be no way. And again, be mindful that God says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. The Holy Spirit, again, is the third person in the Trinity. And when the power of God enables us to do everything, we can truly rejoice in our heart and know that God alone is being glorified. And yet at the same time, God wishes about all, all of us to be saved. But for those who doesn't have an understanding, as the word says, they have ears, but they cannot hear, and eyes, but which they cannot see, the things of light. But the Holy Spirit will bring everything to light and understanding of those that are willing and to comprehend what God is saying, and God is a God of provision. He provides all our needs. And all it takes is to admit that, yes, Lord, we need help. And no matter the status of who you are, whether a leader, follower, God knows the heart of every man. And we give him thanks. We give him praise. We give him honor and always glory. Because he alone will be glorified in our lives. He alone will give us the wisdom to make the right choices. He alone has already given us the best gift. That's Jesus Christ who gave his life for us. So let us commit and submit ourselves to his will. To be accomplished. To advance his kingdom. Let us represent Christ here. And not all of us are at the same level. No, we're not. But for those that are at a level to help and encourage or strengthen, let's just reach to our brothers and sisters as the direction of the Holy Spirit to pull them up where they should be. And as we pull up, we pull up in the name of Jesus Christ, a name that's above all names. And as it was in the beginning, in the days of Paul, the name of Jesus still has power in our lives and in our situations. There was a slight illustration of interaction of Satan knows when we have been anointed, when we are utilizing the gifts that God has given us, when we have fully committed ourselves to the will of God and using the name of Jesus becomes effective. So we're able to influence and impact those. Yes, the enemy knows that. And saying that to say that there's great value that's in us is great blessings in us as believers knowing who we are in god so we can stand boldly and truly say god alone be glorified in my life in everything that concerns me and i lift up the name of jesus the holy spirit he himself will strengthen us to complete everything that we're called to do in our daily lives let us continue to seek god's face for direction and guidance in everything we do and say and we give him thanks for all that he have done he's doing right now and especially he's about to do 
in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.